We're in week 11, Luke chapter 17 to 22. So open your Bible to Luke chapter 17, starting at verse 1. Jesus said to his disciples, Things that cause people to sin are bound to come, but woe to that person through whom they come. It would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around his neck than for him to cause one of these little ones to sin. You know, the words of Christ here seem harsh, almost out of character. But the word is simple to us. Don't be one of those people who cause other people to sin. To prevent that from happening, Jesus says, verse 3, So watch yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. So Jesus then gives us three mandates. Watch yourselves. Rebuke the sinner. Forgive if he repents. That all made sense to the disciples until Jesus said, verse 4, If he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times comes back to you and says, I repent, forgive him. And no wonder the disciples said to Jesus in verse 5, Increase our faith. <laughs> no kidding. We're going to need a lot of faith to forgive a brother who sins against us and repents seven times in a single day. Following Jesus requires that we live and pray like Jesus. We pray, our Father, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Luther wrote this in his ex explanation to the fifth petition of the Lord's Prayer in his small catechism. What does this mean? We pray in this petition that our Father in heaven would not look at our sins or deny our prayer because of them. We are neither worthy of the things for which we pray, nor have we deserved them. But we ask that he would give them all to us by grace. For we daily sin much and surely deserve nothing but punishment. So we too will sincerely forgive and gladly do good to those who sin against us. The key to forgiving others who sin against us and repent again and again is knowing that's what our Father in heaven has done for us every day of our lives. I skip down to verse 11 of the same chapter. Luke records another unique miracle found only in his gospel, the cleansing of the 10 lepers. Uh, go down to verse uh, 15 and 16. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Now if the number of the cleansed lepers who return to give thanks to God is representative of mankind's gratitude to God for all his abundant blessings. How sad is that? One in ten, ten percent? Shouldn't all of the cleansed lepers return to give thanks to God for their healing? Perhaps the lesson for us is just this simple. Be the one who always returns to God with a grateful heart for his blessings especially for the cleansing of your soul. By now you probably noticed how often Luke provides a preface for a parable, a miracle, or just an encounter of Christ. Luke provides it for context as well as commentary to help us better understand Christ's words and intent. Chapter 18, verse 1, And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. In other words, let your prayer life be an expression of your faith in God's abundance. Verse 15, Now they were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. Jesus would tell us every soul matters to God. He also told this parable, verse 9, to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Sinners who trust in God's mercy and love live humble lives of faith and charity toward all people. Chapter 19, verses 1 and 2. He entered Jericho and was passing through, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. Skipping down to verse 9. 
And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Here's the point. There are no limits on God's mercy. Pay close attention to what the religious leaders are doing and thinking to bring Jesus to his cross. Chapter 20, verse 19, the scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hands on him at that very hour, for they perceived that he had told this parable against them. But they feared the people. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be sincere that they might catch him in something he said so as to deliver him up to the authority and jurisdiction of the governor. Verse 26, and they were not able in the presence of the people to catch him in what he said, but marveling at his answer, they became silent. Verse 40, for they no longer dared to ask him any question. Chapter 22, 1 and 2, Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew near, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to put him to death, for they feared the people. Notice, Satan has his hand in all of this. 22 verses 3 to 6, Then Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot, who was one of the number of the twelve. He went away and conferred with the chief priests and the officers how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he consented and sought an opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of a crowd. Our memory verse for the week, Luke 21 verse 33, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. You may not always be able to trust the ground you're standing upon, especially live if you live in California on a fault line. But when you stand on the word of God, you're standing on solid rock for your faith and life. Everything else is sinking sand. By the way, we're taking a break from reading through the New Testament one chapter a day, now through the entire Christmas season. We'll start reading again on Monday, January the 3rd, 2022, for a blessed new year together, in Jesus' name.